My name is Neil Davis. I'm a partner in the insurance disputes team here at Mills and Reeve. I deal with construction and engineering risks. I'm joined this morning by my colleagues, Tim Russell and Nathan Jones, both associates in the insurance dispute team. And again, both who deal with uh, construction and engineering claims. Today, we're going to discuss the case, the recent case of Lendlease and ACOL. The decision touches upon a number of important issues in construction litigation. And we're going to focus on uh, three of those. Uh, firstly, the extent to which contractual uh, provisions can oust statutory limitation periods. Secondly, when a duty to review, advise or warn arises and the scope of that duty. And finally, key points to bear in mind when it comes to holding out authority and reliance on the work on others. I should also mention that colleagues of ours, Adrian Quinton and Dan Pearson, have done an excellent article on this decision and you can find that on the firm's website. So before we jump into the talk itself, a little bit of housekeeping. Firstly, uh, this webinar is being recorded and it will be available afterwards. Uh, we can't see you, but obviously you can see us. If you've got any questions, please can you use the Q&A box and we'll respond to them after the session because we're not, not going to have time to respond to them uh, during the session itself. And finally, there'll be an opportunity to provide feedback in the survey at the end. Please do that. And we'd also be interested in hearing from you about any other topics that you'd like us to cover. So moving on to the case itself, I'm going to start by setting out some background facts. In October 2014, St. James Oncology appointed Lendlease as a DMB contractor for the construction of an oncology centre in Leeds. On the same day, Lendlease appointed ACOM to provide M&E and specialist fire safety services. ACOM provided the design of the plant room to Lendlease in 2005. In the, the case, that's called Plant Room 2. And the plant room is to be a central, the central mechanical and electrical hub for the oncology centre. And that was completed before the end of August 2006. In November 2007, Lendley's asked ACOM to revise the fire strategy to reflect the as-built configuration of that plant room. And in turn, ACOM issued revision 19, the fire safety strategy. Practical completion of the oncology centre was certified on the 14th of December, 2007. Sometime later, it all kicks off in 2019. There are two separate claims. Firstly, a claim by St. James and NG, that's the maintenance contractor, against Lendlease over mechanical, electrical and fire safety defects. And the second claim is by Lendlease against ACOM, <coughs> excuse me, where Lendlease issued proceedings against ACOM on the 13th of May 2019. And they sought to pass down liability in respect of 18 defects and claim damages of around £3 million from ACOM. In the first case, Lendlease was found liable to St. James in 2022 for more than £5 million. The court then considered the second claim against ACOM and handed down the judgment on the 1st of November 2023. So that's some basic facts. And now I'm going to hand over to Tim, who's going to discuss limitation. Thanks, Neil, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, in considering the position on limitation, the court were considering three main points. Firstly, was the consultancy agreement between Lendlease and ACOM a deed or a simple contract? And therefore, did a 12-year limitation period apply or only six years? And therefore, Lendlease's claim would have been well out of time. Secondly, whether a clause within the consultancy agreement allowed for a 12-year period to bring a claim in any event. And finally, whether the claim itself is statute barred despite a 12-year limitation period. Lendlease had executed the consultancy agreement by two directors signing the documents, coupled with the expression that it was being executed as a deed. Two employees of ACOM had signed the document on behalf of ACOM, but they had not signed in the section of the document which asserted that the agreement was being executed as a deed. Instead, they had mistakenly signed in the section which provided for execution by affixing the common seal of ACOM in the presence of two directors. The seal was never actually affixed to the agreement itself. At the time of signing the agreement, neither of the employees were statutory directors of ACOM. ACOM were therefore seeking to argue that the agreement was not executed as a deed for two main reasons. One, it was not signed by two directors or a director and a company secretary. And it was not expressed as being executed by ACOM because of the positioning of the signatures, in that their signatures were purporting to witness the affixing of the company seal. 
Therefore, ACOM are arguing only a six-year limitation period applies to the agreement, not 12 years. ACOM's argument on this point was rejected by the court. As per paragraph 108 of the judgment, which is set out on the slide, it was held that the intention was clearly to execute the agreement as a deed. The agreement had been structured as a deed, included provisions within which reflected this. ACOM had accepted the agreement and the benefits of performing under it, but they were now seeking to try and avoid the consequences of that fact that it was a deed to support their limitation arguments. The court followed the position as set out in the case of Freeman and Lockyer, namely that if a person is held out as being in a particular position or having particular authority on behalf of a company, an estoppel can arise which prevents the company from denying that such a person had the authority normally associated with that position. ACOM had accepted that the individuals who signed the agreement had the authority to do so. The document was therefore held to be a deed and the applicable limitation period was found to be 12 years, not six years. In short, whilst the consultancy agreement had not been executed properly, there was a clear intention by both parties that the agreement would be executed as a deed and ACOM were therefore prevented from arguing against a 12-year limitation period. Lendlease's alternative argument was that even if the agreement was found to be a simple contract within only a six-year limitation period, it operated within the agreement that a 12-year limitation period would still apply. This was on the basis that there was an express contracting out and ouster of the six-year limitation period from the Limitation Act found within the agreement. Clause 14.06 of the agreement provided that no action or proceedings under, the, under or any respect of this agreement in contract or for breach of statutory duty shall be commenced against the consultant after the expiry of 12 years after the completion date for the works. ACOM were arguing that this was an incorrect interpretation and that the clauses Lendlease was seeking to rely upon was a contractual long stop date, but without ousting the statutory limitation period. Following the decision by Judge Ramsey in Oxford's Architects Partnership and Cheltenham Ladies College, it was held that the clause within the agreement was to be interpreted in the same manner as within Oxford Architects, namely that it provided a protection against claims brought after a certain date, but not extending the period in which claims would otherwise be statute barred. Lendlease's argument was therefore rejected. The contractual provision was a long stop date, which did not circumvent the statutory limitation period. Of course, the limitation period had already been determined to be 12 years by virtue of the court finding that the agreement was in fact a deed, not a simple contract. The court were therefore looking at whether the claim itself was actually statute barred. Firstly, the court confirmed that where limitation was put in issue, it was for the claimant, at least, to establish that their claim was not statute barred. The judgment provided a useful reminder for specifically when a cause of action will accrue in both negligence and in breach of contract. For a claim in negligence based on defects in a design for construction, the cause of action accrues where the negligence first, when the negligence first causes damage. In considering this, the court considered the decision in Cameron Taylor Consulting and BDW Trading from 2022 and confirmed that this is when the relevant defective design is incorporated into the building. In practical terms, this is when the drawing containing the defective design was issued to the contractor for construction purposes and the contractor then builds in accordance with the drawing. What matters is what happens after the drawing is completed. A defective drawing on its own proves nothing. The cause of action in negligence is completed when this results in damage. Compare that to a cause of action in a claim for contract, which accrues at the date of breach. A cause of action for defective design will therefore accrue when the design is handed over to the contractor for construction, even if the construction is not completed until substantially later, as set out in paragraph 223 of the judgment. Applying this logic to the key dates involved in this matter, Lendlease had issued court proceedings on the 30th of May 2019. For the claims regarding plant room 2 and the non-plant room defects, the relevant act or omission would have had to have taken place after the 30th of May 2007. The original design for plant room 2 had been handed over by ACOM in July 2005, and the design had been completed by August 2006. Although practical completion itself had been completed on the 14th of December 2007, plant room 2 itself had been completed by this stage for some time. Lendlease's claim was therefore held to be statute barred, as none of the relevant acts or omissions relating to the defects had occurred less than 12 years prior to the issue of the claim. The judgment covers a wide range of aspects of limitation and multiple arguments raised by both parties. Whilst ACOM were prevented from succeeding with their argument regarding the execution of their consultancy agreement because of the party's clear intention to execute as a deed, the situation could have been easily avoided. 
whilst the judgment is helpful should you ever find yourself in a situation where another party is arguing that the document has not been properly executed as a deed, careful consideration should always be given to ensure the document is executed properly and by individuals with the proper authority to do so. From a record keeping perspective, it always ensures that copies of the executed documents are properly stored and backed up. The judgment also provides a helpful reminder of when a cause of action will accrue for a defective design in both negligence and in breach of contract. And finally, the claimant may be able to overcome a limitation defence by establishing that there was a continuing duty to advise, warn or review. On this basis, construction professionals should always be mindful of any contractual provisions that could be interpreted as conferring such a duty on them. I'll now hand over to Nathan, who will be discussing exactly what were ACOM's obligations under the agreement. Thanks, Tim. So the court's approach to assessing ACOM's obligations under the consultancy agreement and therefore to what extent any continuing duty to review, revise or warn arose was methodical and a good reminder to us all how best to approach considering the same. Uh, as such, we'll consider each stage of their conclusion to get the best understanding of how others can best protect themselves and set out the intended obligations of those on a project clearly, minimising the scope for any disputes and or delay from the outset. Now, as the slide suggests, the first stage of considering the scope of ACOM's duty uh, required determination whether the obligations lend lease owed St James had been stepped down to ACOM. The relevant clauses for this purposes were 1.01 and 4.01. The former sought to put ACOM on notice of lend leases obligations to St James and secure a warranty from ACOM that they'd observe them and ensure their actions do not put lend lease in breach of their own agreement with St James. Uh, however, the latter provided that notwithstanding the rest of the consultancy agreement, particularly the warranties in 1.01 for our purposes, uh, the ACOM's duty under the consultancy agreement was expressly limited to that of reasonable care, skill and diligence. On that basis, the court found that 401 meant lend leases obligation to St. James had not been stepped down, as to do so would involve reading 401 as saying, notwithstanding any other clause in this agreement, save for clause 1.01, and there simply wasn't any support for doing so. The clear lesson, therefore, is that if you want to step down any obligations, you need to make it explicitly clear in the contract if you want to be able to rely on and enforce that stepping down later. Given lend leases obligations were not simply stepped down, it was then necessary to assess the scope of the design obligations ACOM had taken up under the consultancy agreement. The key here, as is often the case, was the wording of the schedule of duties. This defined ACOM's obligations by reference to tasks and functions as at given stages of the works, key point being that due to obligations being dependent on that staging, there could be periods when the time for ACOM to perform an activity identified in a part of that matrix had passed. It was therefore the court's view that ACOM would not be responsible for the faulty implementation of its design if that implementation was by others and the fault was not due to the design itself, provided ACOM neither controlled the implementation nor was allocated with responsibility for it by the agreement. There was evidence of ACOM instructing others how to implement parts of its design, so it would not, for example, be open to ACOM to argue it was Rotary Yorkshire Limited, who are lend leases installation subcontractor for MEP services, uh, that caused a defect if ACOM instructed Rotary to install something a particular way, on which more later. Uh, as to the period after their responsibility for designing had passed, uh, which the court accepted to be what was then Reba Stage E, uh, ACOM still had to exercise reasonable care and skill when providing comments on others' designs under Clause 6.08, but on the basis that ACOM were not the author of any such plans. Now, that's quite a bit to digest in a short space of time. So, to briefly recap, having interpreted the contract to assess the scope of ACOM's duties, the court had found by this point, first, that obligations owed by Lendley's to St James hadn't been stepped down to ACOM, and second, when the designing responsibility had passed, i.e. after Reba Stage E, ACOM was still under a contractual duty to exercise reasonable care and skill when providing comments on others' designs. In tackling whether a continuing duty to review, advise or warn arose from ACOM's involvement after their design had been incorporated into the works, the courts dealt with some useful reminders of general principles for us all to keep in mind when seeking to include or assess a continuing duty to review, advise or warn in construction contracts, consultancy or otherwise. First, 
Generally, where there's a designer who also supervises or inspects work, they're obliged to review their design up until that design has been included in the work. There is, however, a case law supporting that duty continuing until practical completion if circumstances warrant. Secondly, contractual obligations are key. Either they solely provide for design or go beyond that, which might mean an obligation to review up to incorporation into the works or practical completion. If that obligation isn't clearly set out, the new Islington case is a useful comparator, as the court referred to in Lindley's. That held that in the absence of an express term or instruction, an architect, the comparator in this case, is not under a duty to review the design unless something occurs to make it necessary or prudent for a reasonably competent architect to have done so. That, for example, might be learning and material they'd recommended is not fit for purpose, so new information can be supplied. As the obligations applicable to ACOM, the consultancy agreement, particularly Clause 6, uh, clearly included obligations going beyond just supplying design, i.e. to comment on the designs of others under Clause 6 that we've already seen earlier. But ACOM weren't responsible for overseeing the project as a whole, so couldn't be said to be supervising for the purposes of determining their duties. Instead, the lead designer under the consultancy agreement was specified as the project's architect. Now, ultimately, the court determined that ACOM's role after provision of their design was to be interpreted under the consultancy agreement such that ACOM were not under a duty to review the work of others or provide unsolicited advice as to the compliance of others' work with applicable standards. It is clear, therefore, that the court will be reluctant to interpret wider reaching duties into contract unless expressly stated and evidence to be the intention. So it's crucial to keep a good record of any contract discussions or negotiations and ensure everyone has the same evidenced understanding of the obligations they're taking on before starting any work. Lastly, as to its own design, the court held the contract provided no express requirement for ACOM to keep it or plant room two under review after it was constructed. Therefore, if you want a consultant to have a continuing obligation to review its design and implementation thereof, insert it expressly into the contract. Now, while it was ultimately found that ACOM had no wide continuing duty after their design was incorporated into plant room two as built, in essence, they only needed to respond to express instructions or requests for further advice. The court rather helpfully reminded us of a few key things to keep in mind uh, when considering how such a duty might arise and operate. First, the duty would only be triggered if there was good reason to warrant such a review. In this instance, there simply wasn't such a trigger as first, Plant Run 2 was materially complete by August 2006. Rev 19 to the design was made on the 19th of November 2007, so over a year after material completion. And lend own argument was that ACOM's involvement in Rev 19 was only requested to enable practical completion to be certified. Second, where there's no wider express duty to keep construction under review after a particular consultant's design had been implemented, the circumstances in which further advice is sought from that consultant will be key. In this particular case, simply to illustrate the point, that meant the court making a finding of fact that circumstances surrounding Rev 19 uh, in November 2007 were essentially for ACOM to rubber stamp the revised as-built design uh, rather than provide substantive advice. Uh, this reflected itself in a couple of things, uh, examples of which are the following. So first, in October and November, the court found ACOM was being instructed to revise the drawing and the fire strategy to accord with the as-built configuration of plant room two. It wasn't asked to provide advice and the reservations it expressed were overridden and met with the response that the manner of installation had been approved by Leeds Building Control. ACOM was simply being required to perform the exercise so that practical completion could be certified. And second, Lend lease, having given the instructions which it did, and having done so in terms which made it clear that it was relying on its own judgment and on that of building control, couldn't say that ACOM should have done more under the consultancy agreement. So if you're relying on a consultant's advice, make it clear in black and white. Finally, it's not the same as in tort as in contract. And for that reason, ACOM actually had a relatively lucky escape. The court accepted there could have been another action as the absence of the dampness required to give effect to the 60-minute fire rating only materialised due to ACOM's instructions to installers, that's rotary again, uh, not to include them in August 2006. However, as we've already explored, 
that action wasn't pursued and would have been out of time in the event. Now, were the claim able to proceed in negligence, ACOM's own fire safety expert witness conceded that ACOM would have been in breach of their common law duty uh, to warn by failing to advise Rev 19 was non-compliant with Health Technical Memo 81 and the necessary 60-minute fire rating. So put simply, even where a contractual claim might fail, one in tort could, in the right circumstances, succeed, of course, provided you bring it in time. Thanks. Thanks, Nathan. Sorry. Um, and thanks, Tim. So I, I think this is a, a really interesting case because it covers so many different areas and the court provides um, a reminder of the importance of contractual terms on some, some of the key issues. Some of the things that jump out for me, uh, firstly, the need for a clear express wording should the parties wish to alter the normal statutory limitation period. Secondly, it's obviously not great if parties don't execute the contract, in this case a deed, correctly. However, the courts are going to take a dim view where a party seeks to take the benefits of that contract and simultaneously tries to avoid some of the obligations, particularly here using technical breaches relating to execution. Finally, the duty to review and warn can be tricky, but the overall position remains that there is no general obligation to do so unless it's specifically included in the contract. Rather, the obligation only really arises if it's triggered, and that's fact-specific. And when it is triggered, it's necessary to consider the breadth of that obligation as a result of the trigger. So that brings us to the end of the session. hope you found it useful. As I said at the start, um, if you have any questions, please do put them in the Q&A box and we'll respond to them later by email. We'd also welcome your feedback. Um, suggested topics would be really, really helpful as well. So as I said, that's the end of the talk. I hope you found it useful um, and uh, you can join us again for the, for the next breaking ground. And um, it just leaves me to, to wish you the rest of a good day. Thank you.